Hello, gluttoners. Welcome back. It's another episode of High Gluttony. Today, I am making carbonara, a sauce that is so rich, I haven't had it in probably at least a year, maybe longer. Yeah, it is, it's a little bit of a tricky sauce, only because you're dealing with some heat factors. Also, the breadth of different recipes you can find on the internet is astonishing. But we're gonna break this down in the simplest way possible. I am using a recipe from Serious Eats by Donald Gritzer. Oh, not Donald, Jesus. I already had my smoke, so let's, let's start with that. I've had a little bit of Oreos. Still working my way through that. Slow weed tolerance along with my low alcohol tolerance means I don't get to party like I used to. So I had like the tiniest little bit of weed and yeah, I am nice and high. There should be a fun episode, a little bit of a romp and I get to eat carbonara at the end of it. So yay. I love carbonara. We talked already about our weed. I'm actually having something I did on a total label buy. It's called Cosmic Kitty. I love the label because it has a little kitty in a basket and it's being flown around by the moon like it's a hot air balloon. I love it. I don't wanna say it's, it's not a very good illustration. Obviously somebody was a really good artist, but the stars are just your basic not picking your pencil off the paper kind of star where you draw the lines in between. But the moon is very detailed and the kitty is really cute. I love it. I love the label. It got me on the label. And the smell is really good too. This is actually what they call a petit, pet knot or a petillant natural wine. Uh, fermented, it has some lees in it. So that is what's providing the fermentation. It smells really good. I did pop it in the fridge for a little while. It's very, well, it's got Grunewittliner in it, and I can definitely tell it has Grunewittliner in it. Grunewittliner, whoever, whatever you wanna say. So on this Cosmic Kitty wine, we've got Vermentino, Zebbiolo, not Nebbiolo. Uh, oh, actually, oh, sorry, Zebibio. No else, Z-I, B I B B O. At least I think that's an O. It could be an A, but I'm pretty sure it's an O. Grunewittliner, Nero Davla, and Verdejo. It's from South Australia. It smells really good and is only 12% alcohol, which is making me very happy right now because those are my favorite kind of wines because I can actually drink them and not be fucking smashed. Will be interest, I, will, I will be interested to see how this pairs with the, the carbonara. I did look up online a sort of general guideline of something I should pair with carbonara. There are some various suggestions. Uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay came up. There was a lot of different Italians that were thrown at me. Didn't have any of that. So rosé was another suggestion. Probably in general, the recommendation would be like a Pinot Noir rosé, or maybe a Sangiovese rosé. I haven't seen one of those in a while. Might be the, the best choices. This has almost like a savory quality to it, so I'm, I'm hoping that won't fight with the, with the wine. With the pasta, when I get to that point, oh, it's got a little funk to it. Ah, uh, what is that thing that's in Pinotage? It smells like Band-Aids. A little bit. Just, just a tiny bit. It's not like distracting, but it, has a little bit of that band-aidiness. But the aromatics defy what's actually going on in the palate because there is that savoriness. It's nice and round from the, the lees, but it really has great acidity. I think this might be a really good pairing. Fingers crossed. Yeah, it's a touch savory, which is something I always appreciate in wine. Even though I love sweet wine as its own thing, love it when a wine is savory. Let's talk about carbonara, because I'm actually excited. I literally thought of this yesterday because I have all the ingredients in the house. Since I, I bought some guncale weeks ago, and I still have a couple of pieces left, which 
I could have cut up a couple more pieces, I think, but I didn't want it to be too rich, and I thought if I used three pieces, it might be too much, because we are dealing with guincale, so you got that fat, egg yolks, that's fat. The recipe wants me also to put in a little bit of olive oil, so that's fat too. I'm going on the lighter end with my guincale. Um, God, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Sorry, guanciale, my bad. So when I had this idea yesterday, I went on the internet and started looking at recipes. Or was that this morning? I don't know, it was recently. I thought I was losing my fucking mind because every recipe I came across used whole eggs and I had been taught to use egg yolks. I was like, how bad is my memory? No. Turns out that's just like something that people have decided to do because whole eggs are easier to deal with than yolks. I think is part of the reasoning behind that. So yeah, I thought I was losing my mind for a minute there until I came across Daniel Gritzer's recipe, which is using egg yolks. And I even looked at Marcella and in her book, Essentials of Classic Italian Cooking, her recipe uses two whole eggs, two large eggs, that's it. Daniel's use, uses a combo. I'm only going to use yolks because I'm making a single portion for me and I'm just used to using just yolk, so that's my problem. But he did have a really interesting note. I had always been taught that the heat from the pasta itself is what's supposed to cook the egg. He says it's just not quite enough to get it fully to where it should be. He recommends either using the pan to cook it a little bit more, which is risky, because you run the much higher risk of scrambling your egg yolks or a double boiler method where you reuse your pan that your pasta cooked in as a double boiler and much res less risky, easier to control the temperature. I'm on board, great. Reusing dishes, awesome. Keeping your pasta water around, even more awesome because you wanna use that to make your sauce the right consistency. Basic, basic, basic recipe goes as follows. Or wait, no, let's, let's talk a little bit more about carbonara. The origins of this pasta are murky at best. There are two sort of main stories that they tell about this pasta as far as like, where did it come from? How can you trust any food story? Because somebody marketed it along the way and decided this was a great story to tell about this. We have these two main theories, but Daniel Gritzer says in all likelihood, it's just that it's, these are ingredients that have been around for a long time. It uses one of every of the top five domesticated animals that humans use. So you've got all of your animal fats in one dish. You've got your egg from chickens. You've got your pork. You've got your Parmesan cheese, which comes from cows and Pecorino Romano, which comes from sheep. But here are your other theories or other explanations of how this dish came to be. Number one is during, after World War II, American soldiers befriended some, you know, local Italians wherever they were stationed, brought them American bacon and eggs and said, here, turn this into a pasta sauce. That seems like a ridiculous origin story in my opinion. Second origin story that seems maybe more, slightly more likely, but equally as ridiculous because it involves miners and the fact that they needed a really filling meal for their midday meal that was quick and, uh, I already said filling, so quick and filling. But this legend kind of, to me, is just gross because <laughs> you're supposed to use a heavy amount of black pepper as part of the sauce and that's supposed to represent the carbon flakes that would have been in the helmet of said miners. Number one, they'd be wearing their helmets in the, the mine, so their, mi their, their helmets would be gross from their heads. And then two, you're cooking your lunch in there and it's kind of a creamy, sticky sauce. That is not easy to clean out of a helmet. Then you're running the risk of having to clean your helmet before going back on the job. And this seems almost a ridiculous story, but this is just the name. The carbonara actually comes from the little flakes of pepper because they look like carbon or, you know, they look like coal. 
that's the the absolutely ridiculous origin story that I was told this is the number one I'd heard, but I wasn't like, I didn't believe it, but I didn't question it. And now I'm like, gross. Also, seems highly unlikely they were just cooking in their fucking helmets. You gotta wash your helmet twice in that whole process. And are helmets really good for cooking? Too many problems. Moving on to carbonara and what is carbonara and what is not carbonara. Luckily, I only found one recipe that used cream. Get the fuck out of here with your fucking cream in my carbonara. If it has cream, it is not carbonara. Don't call it that. Fuck you. It doesn't use cream. (laughs) And sad to say, it's the pioneer woman that is now earning my ire because her, her recipe had cream in it. This is not fucking carbonara. No, no, no. Get the fuck out of here with that shit. The, the basic recipe for any carbonara is pork product of the cured variety, egg, cheese, black pepper. If you want to be fancy, you can throw a little garlic in. I'm going to throw a little garlic in just for fun. But traditionally, I don't think it was actually included as part of it. I came across plenty of recipes that added shallot or onion. Some recipes took 10 steps. It really isn't that complicated. I don't think it's a 10 step process, but they were like dumping the fat out, adding it back. And that was Bon Appetit. You just leave all the fat in there. It's supposed to be fatty. The recipe from Daniel states that he thinks the guanchale, guanchale is most likely the original pork product in this, just because It's usually seasoned with more spices and things, and it's a little bit fattier, so it really would have made a really silky sauce. But pancetta is very commonly used and could be original. We're not sure. But a lot of people make it with American bacon as well to get that smoky component, which I gotta say is not bad. I've, I've definitely had a lot, a lot of carbonara made with American bacon. So we've covered the double boiler, we've covered the fat. Now in the end, his recipe does also use whole eggs in addition to egg yolks. It's a four four person portion. He used six eggs in total, which was four yolks and then two whole eggs. He did say that the sauce using just oaks was, just oaks. Just yolks was much thicker, whereas the egg white, the one with the egg white was a little bit more runny. Maybe he's using both to his advantage here since he's using more yolk than whole egg. He's counting on that egg to thicken, that yolk to thicken it a little bit extra, but also using that egg white to loosen the sauce just enough. This is my assumption. I didn't read that part of the recipe. (laughs) And yeah, pasta water, saving a little bit of the pasta water is essential. So that's another reason I like using this double boiler method is we're gonna have our water, it'll be right there, it'll be warm, we can add it in. I might do something a little bit tricksy and actually temper in some of the pasta water before I put it over the double boiler, just a little bit to warm it up, then add the pasta and toss and then We'll slowly add a little bit water to time just to get the right consistency. I changed this so that it was just the amounts I'm going to use. So I'm just gonna do that. For one person, (laughs) you're going to use four ounces of dried spaghetti, two slices of diced guanciale, guanciale, two teaspoons extra virgin olive oil. Trust me, I'm not gonna be measuring that. Two egg yolks, grated pecorino romano, more than I probably should be using. Grated Parmigiano Reggiano, more than I probably should be using, and this may come around and bite me in the ass. And freshly ground black pepper. Ground medium coarse. And I did slice up a little bit of garlic that I'm gonna toss in uh, with my guanciale when I reheat it. We're gonna start the pasta cooking. If we were doing this all contemporaneously, which I'm gonna cook the pasta and just have to reheat my guanciale, guanciale. <clears throat> if you're going all in one go, you want to start with rendering out your 
cured pork product of choice, so my guanciale, and then you get a pot on to boil for your pasta. Technically, you can use cooked pasta. Just remember, you might want to lightly warm it up somehow before adding it into the bacon or whatever pork product you're using. You put a pot of water on to boil, and then once it's boiling, add your pasta, cook till just under al dente. And hopefully this will coincide with your pork product being nicely rendered out. If you're adding some extra flavoring, those things being cooked just a little bit, you add your pasta, make sure you coat it really well with that pork product and its fat. Then, shoot, sorry, I did miss a step here because it's while your pasta water is coming to a boil and your guanciale is rendering, you're gonna wanna mix together the egg yolks, the cheese, the black pepper, and let me check to see if I actually need to be putting the olive oil in there with that. The whole egg yolks, pecorino romano, parmigiano par reggio, and black pepper. Using tongs and a strainer, transfer the pasta to the skillet with the crisp guanciale and its fat. Be sure not to drain boiling pasta water. Add part of the olive oil to the pasta and stir to combine. Let cool slightly. Scrape pasta, pork, and all the fat into the egg mixture. Measure half a cup of pasta cooking water to add to the pasta and egg mixture. Stir well to combine. And this, you know, very quickly. Then set mixing bowl over boiling pasta water. Make sure the bottom of the bowl does not touch the water and cook. Stirring quickly with tongs until the sauce thickens into a creamy silk, until the sauce thickens to a creamy, silky consistency and leaves trails as you stir. Remove from heat, season with salt if needed, which it may not, and divide into bowls. Serve right away, topping with more grated cheese and freshly ground pepper as desired. So that's it, very quick. I did already render out my guanciale. We're gonna start by mixing together our egg yolks with our cheeses and the pepper, which I don't think I've ground yet. I'm gonna bring my pasta water to a boil and once that comes up to a boil, I'll add the pasta and we will be off to the races on this. If you're making this pasta with previously cooked noodles, make sure you save some of your pasta water and bring it back to boiling or warm it up in the microwave maybe. I don't know. I don't know how that would go. Daniel also recommends cooking in as little water as possible so you get a nice concentration of starch that comes off the pasta. This seems quite important and I love this tip. Get into maybe some pasta boiling techniques at some point. Maybe that'll be part of my I have a hysterectomy so I can barely move series, we'll see. But let's get into the kitchen and make this shit. Very excited. And I'm hungry now, because I've been thinking about this intensely all day. If I don't remember how to do this, I should be shot as a chef, I think. We've got my cheese and bowl. I'm gonna add in my eggs. They're dried out just a little bit and are sticking to my little dish. And I'm gonna get the pepper. Let's check our water. I have had it heating up for a little bit over here just so that I wouldn't have to wait too long for it to boil. And I did do something kind of sacrilegious where I cracked my pasta in half just so that it fit in the little pot I'm using. So I got that, and I'm going to give my yolk mixture a stir. Ooh, that's very thick. So I might add a little olive oil to this just to start so that it is not too, too thick. Yeah, I think I am gonna loosen this with the uh, a little bit of water to start. But I'm gonna wait until I've got my pasta cooked. Hopefully cooked. All right, I've got my ladle sitting to one side to use for my water. Bring my Mixture over here. Looks like we're well boiling now. I do have some bucatini that I'm using. Oh my God, this camera is amazing. And now you can tell I'm stoned because all I'm doing is taking pictures of pasta boiling in water. <laughs> Exciting. Oh, I didn't salt my water. Oopsies. 
Now, depending on the saltiness of your pork product, you, you might want to alter the amount you're salting your water. My guanciale is not overly salty. Or it might be super salty, I don't know. I'm not the best person to ask because I love salt. Not as much as some people, but I do love salt. And I didn't set a timer, so I will be having to taste this once it goes. Now I feel sad for the amount of pasta I'm making, but it's very rich, so you should remember that. Very rich. I really like this wine. Because it has very floral aromatics, I was expecting it to be really floral on the palate, and it's really not that floral. I'm bubbling away there. Very thick. Very, very thick. Come on, food. All right, let's see what my noodles are doing. Starting to get a little softer. Not quite there yet. I pushed my pancetta off to the side here. I don't want to burn it. And I'm going to add in my little bit of garlic here. And I'm fine with just adding this into the pan cold because it'll help me help tell me how warm the pan is. Have it on medium high heat. I'm getting close to done. It's a little bit chewy, but it's really not very far off. Hopefully this will start to crackle a little bit soon. There we go. Great. So I just put in an ounce of boiling water there. Yep, I think I'm done. The nice thing about bucatini is you can pick up every damn noodle out of the pot. Right. Oh gosh, throwing noodles onto the stove top. Again, can pick up those little bucatini noodles, no problem. So, turning my heat off here. I think I'm well coated. Throw in a little olive oil. Stir, stir, stir. So now we're on top of the double boiler and my God, what a relation. Yes. I mean, I've definitely got this to work before. I mean, part of this is just getting things to the right temperature. That's perfect. Oh, and get a serving bowl down. Okay, I could have added probably a little bit more water to this, but not a lot because I think it was only half a cup for four and I did add an ounce, slightly more than an ounce probably to it to thin it out. So maybe that's the ad other advantage of using a whole egg is that it's slightly thinned out. And I do have a little bit of scrambling up the bottom of my pot. But not too bad. Now, let's taste. Do we need salt? Maybe do a little salt and turn some cheese. Not a lot. Now, Marcello's recipe did use white wine. And the advantage I can see to using a little bit of white wine in this as well is that you'll get a bit of acid from the wine. See, I went so fast with that, I forgot to take any pictures on the way through. Top with a little bit of, or a lot of, Pecorino Romano. And a little bit of Parmesan. So let's taste. Stir and taste. Oh yeah. That's good. <laughs> it's really good. Probably could have used just a smidge more water or 30 seconds less on the double boiler. It's a little thick. Might be slightly scrambled, but still amazing. God, I love carbonara. That's your, your carbonara episode, gluttoneers. What do you think? Your thoughts? Do you have thoughts on carbonara? Please share them with me. I love people's thoughts about carbonara. There will be some notes on the recipes that I found on the website once this episode goes up. And, oh yeah, off we go. I didn't bring my coconuts. Here, I'll clap together two pieces of cheese. 
because you got pecorino and parmesan right here. That's the sound of pecorino and parmesan working together. <laughs> okay. See you next time. <laughs>